as a lawyer, please don't sue me for putting out your beautiful face. <laughs> so do you agree? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm I'm okay with uh with being in your vlog. <laughs> Hawaii is the 50th state of the United States of America, and it's known as the melting pot, where indifferent ethnic groups have called it their home. Migration to this island state started when waves of workers from different countries were hired by the sugarcane plantation companies back in the early 1600s. I am Theda Pilar Pineda, and as an immigrant in the 80s from the Philippines, Hawaii, and in particular Kalihi, has been kind to me with its many people of mixed ancestry who value family and friends. And as gracious as Hawaii had been to me, in turn through I Love Kalihi Vlogs would like to share with you the lovely people I met who we considered as treasures of the community. Hi friends of I Love Kalihi Vlogs. The first ever feature in this vlog is someone who was introduced to me by a friend from the University of Hawaii. When I was looking for somebody who could speak about music and music production for an episode of the Mahalima Mana. However, when I realized that this person has a lot of involvement in the Hawaii community from legal issues to the different art forms, I had to ask if I could feature him separately. Let's meet Lance D. Collins. So it's so nice to meet you. Uh, could you kindly introduce yourself? Uh, uh, my name is Lance D. Collins. Uh, I'm an attorney in private practice uh, on the island of Maui. Um, I did live for a time uh, in Honolulu and actually Kalihi specifically. Um, but I did, I moved back to Maui and I, I live uh, full time in Maui again. Oh, speaking of your education, can you tell us uh, the progression of your education? Um, so I dropped out of high school uh, when I was 15. And, uh, and then I went immediately to Maui Community College and uh, got my associate's degree. And then I went to the University of Hawaii at Manoa and got my bachelor's degree uh, and then my master's degree. Um, and then I went to law school. And then after law school, I um, earned my PhD. So I, I got my PhD in Philippine studies, but um, through the political science department. Oh, why the interest in Philippine study? Any relations with the Filipinos? Uh, you don't look any, like you have any. Oh, oh I thought. see. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Well, uh, my mother is a Filipina um, and Filipino and Philam so, cultures. Uh, have always been part of my life. And uh, it just happened that the thing I wanted to write about and to do research on um, involved the Philippines and Philippine culture. So uh, that's why I chose Philippine studies. Also, when it comes to music, how, when did this start for you? Music has always had a significant uh, part in my life. Um, as a small child, I remember my grandparents uh, late at late in the evening listening to the radio. Uh, um, also, my grandmother had a piano. My Lola had a piano, and um, she would play music. And she, I guess, she knew how to play music by ear as well because she could read music. But she could also, if you she listened to a tune, she could play it on the piano. Wow! And uh, so that sort of was somewhat encouraged uh in in my own uh, growing up but not in a serious disciplined way where i ended up learning how to be a master at the piano or something like that so and singing of course that's something that like at parties and so forth everybody's involved with why, why was it so important to be creative in music production leading for you to produce albums blending filipino and hawaiian languages culture and music so maybe about 15 years ago um uh, my spouse, who is from Ilocos Norte originally, but also grew up in Maui, um, we started going to Ilocos very frequently, actually. And um, in that process, uh, I became very close with a whole bunch of uh, his nieces and nephews. Young, and um, I played for them some Hawaiian music. And of course, there's the whole Hawaiiano tradition, you know, in uh, experience in, in Ilocano life and stuff. But the experience of Hawaiian music is very um, specific and also very exotic in some ways. And so I was playing mostly Hapa Haole music uh, from the 1930s and 40s, which I enjoy listening to. All of the songs I played, they all had these strong reactions to positive, uh, and that kept in my mind. And then, of course, also uh, it, uh, at Wake in um, Inilocos, 
particularly for older folks who possibly had worked in Hawaii, uh, but even those that hadn't, uh, you know, I heard multiple times the Spanish band play Aloha Oi without lyrics, just, just the song. Anyway, so all of those things were sort of in my mind and, you know, the kids eventually grew up and, and that sort of stuff. And I was working on these uh, albums, these Hawaiian music albums. And I just thought, hey, you know, we have all these people, all of this talent, all of this stuff. It would be great to do a Hawaiian Philippine sort of mix and just see what does it sound like to have Philippine songs done in Hawaiian? And what does it sound like to have, um, you know, Hawaiian songs in in Philippine languages. Uh, as a lawyer, um, can you tell us what you have done for the community and in you know in respect to your specialty and how does it feel to be able to help? Um, sure. So most of the cases that I take um, are public interest cases that other attorneys won't take. Um, and it's usually representing just ordinary people in the community against either the government or big business or both. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd I would like to say that I've, I've won every case that I've ever taken, but it's not true. Um, uh, I've won many, and I feel that even in the cases that uh, I haven't won, you know, I feel that we still have gotten the government or big business or both in those cases to change the way that they interact with ordinary people, even if we didn't, you know, win in court. Um, so I feel very fulfilled by those types of cases. Um, and I feel that it's important because I feel that ordinary people uh, should have uh, the same access to the law um, that, you know, people of, of affluent means or people who are well connected um, have. And uh, I, I feel very strongly that um, our democratic uh, way of living uh, is in peril if the ordinary person does not have um, the same access to the law. Can you tell us a little bit about this pro bono job that you did and you are acknowledged for it? So I guess that might be referring to the um, the judiciary award that, that I got in 2018. Um, so in that case, <clears throat> there was a... a it doesn't exist anymore. It burned down in the fire, sadly. Uh, but it, there's a place called Front Street Apartments, and it basically had about 250 uh, low-income individuals. Low-income either being because they had a disability or they were a senior on a fixed income. The developer of that project had agreed in exchange for tens of millions of dollars in tax um, credits to make that affordable for 35 years. Uh, or 50 years. And um, after 10 years of it being an affordability, it asked the state to be released from that requirement. And uh, there was nothing in the law that allowed the state to do that. But the state basically said, okay, go ahead. Um, and so we sued them um, and said, you represented the tenants that live there and said, you can't do that. The law doesn't allow it. The thing you recorded against the title of the property says you can't do that. So you have to keep it affordable. Uh, and the U.S. Federal District Court agreed and ruled that uh, what the state had done was illegal and that the property should continue to be in affordability. Uh, the developer appealed that, but during that process, there was a settlement with the state. And so the end result was that everybody agreed that the property would be affordable for another 50 years, starting from a couple of years ago. Now, of course, sadly, it's burned down, so... Um, but those folks uh, were able to basically stay in their apartments and not have to face the threat of their rents being increased to market rate. So you mentioned about that area has been um, burned down now. Um, can you give us a little update? I don't really know what's going on now with mommy. I went there to volunteer uh, after the, the fire for our church and stuff, but I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, is there any update? I, maybe in regards to at least those people that you've helped, because we know they, I could see how everybody's so displaced. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, one of the problems that um, Maui has, and this might be something true for all of Hawaii, um, is that access to housing um, is in short supply. Um, and that's primarily, at least in Maui, because quite a few apartments and homes that could be used 
for people for long-term rentals are being used for short-term vacation rentals. Um, and so it, it's a problem. And that was before there was a fire. And once you burn down 2,000 homes, and mind you, Lahaina Town, many, many people think that Lahaina Town is like a resort place and it's a, full of tourists. Well, the people who visit Lahaina are tourists, but most of the homes that were in the burn zone were all owner occupied or were long term long term rentals uh, but mostly it's it was mostly an owner occupied town it was people who working people who uh lived there so what happens if you burn down 2000 buildings where people who are owner occupants live well they have to go somewhere uh and if there's already a shortage of available housing uh it just makes it worse and so that problem hasn't been solved at all um the Red Cross, I guess, announced that they were able to negotiate that wherever people were staying in the hotels, because there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people staying in hotels still, that they would not have to move until after the holidays. Because unfortunately, it's very bleak right now. Um, my hope is that the efforts of uh, myself and other attorneys and other community organizations uh, will be able to create enough space so that people don't feel like they're forced to leave uh, Maui because there's no alternative. Yes, when we went there, we've seen, I mean, we've helped some people um, camping on the beach area. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is not going to be for a short time. There's just so much, oh, I don't even know. I don't even want to think about it. It's so sad. And um, so at the moment, um, are there plans to rebuild that area that was burned? I'm Mark Shklov, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today, we're going across the sea to Maui to talk with attorney Lance Collin. Lance is a thoughtful, public-spirited Maui lawyer who grew up on Maui and who is now seeking a fair and appropriate solution for Lahaina homeowners who may face the foreclosure of mortgages on their homes that were lost in the recent Maui wildfires. You know, they did a, it wasn't a scientific survey, but it, I, I think it captured the sentiment of the community. Over 75% of people who lived in Lahaina said that they wanted to stay and rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, and that hasn't changed. But the question is, is if they're gonna be able to, because what normally happens after natural disasters in the US is that the the bigger the differences between the amount that insurance for people who have mortgages that insurance pays and the cost to actually rebuild, the bigger that difference is, the more likely people are to are, are to move away and not rebuild. Um, and in Lahaina, that the difference between the average payout and how much it's going to cost to rebuild is pretty significant. So um, that is a danger. Well, knowing that issue, what do you think would be the best um, solution? Like, um, if it has to involve with the government. So, you know, I've asked um, the governor and uh, the various federal agencies that supervise mortgages to uh, do a mortgage deferment, um, a general mortgage deferment for residential properties for three years. Um, and ask the governor under his emergency powers, because he suspended a whole number of laws to include in that the foreclosure law as respect to residential properties in Lahaina, so that folks who live there are not constantly in the state of trying to figure out what is my immediate next move and actually have time to really plan out, okay, if we're going to rebuild, how how do I do that? What does it look like? And what kind of financing do I need? And if you have the gun of foreclosure at your head the whole time, it's very difficult to make those long-term plans because you're constantly trying to figure out how do I stop this thing from happening? Um, so anyways, that's one thing that uh, I've, you know, I've asked for. The other thing that um, uh, is going on, and I, I did help draft some language for that, is to modify the way real property tax uh, occurs in Maui. So that it encourages people who are currently holding their properties vacant so they can do long uh, short-term vacation rentals to use that for long-term rentals and to basically figure out what the cost to society is for people not using their properties for long-term rentals and then basically adjust the tax rates so that it reflects that the people who are basically imposing a cost on society by insisting on using their property in one way as opposed to another basically bear at least some of the burden of that cost and that it's not all 
the rest of society that has to has to take on that responsibility. So I'm not sure where that's going because I just helped draft it and I'm not involved in the in the lobbying part of it. Um, but that that is something that has been under discussion with the mayor and the council. And I think that there's some proposals, including the one I drafted. Um, For the interest of tourists or, or people that are just guests, including me. And I love Lahaina. I have friends that live there, in fact. Um, uh, are there plans to at least fix that area because it's so touristy and that's like for me it's like a little Waikiki that is safe you know we love hanging around there the banyan tree we have pictures right on top of the, the branches there when we were high school days you know so it's a lot of memories not just for Maui people I mean even for people like us that live here that would visit our friends in Lahaina yeah, well I you know Lahaina is a nationally recognized historic landmark and the county has two historic districts that overlap uh, with each other. So that's one of the issues in terms of the rebuilding is what is some of that going to look like um, in terms of the historical part. So that's one issue. The other issue, of course, is that there's a whole bunch of shoreline properties that under the rules regarding sea level rise and climate change, um, people would not be allowed to rebuild. And so I think they're still trying to discuss exactly what does that mean? Uh, um, are there people allowed to traverse in that area already at this point? So all of the area is open to residents and authorized personnel. Yeah, so it is open, but only for people to basically go to their homes and sift through ash. Wow. Okay. It's kind of, it's depressing, but uh, that's what it is. But anyway, let's go back to music. <laughs> More happy. <laughs> Aloha Oi, unlike the other ones on the first Kuili album, was actually translated uh, primarily by Lilia Sanchez. She translated that and, and then she had one of her um, classes perform it at one of the Timpuyo picnics. And I have to tell you, it was uh, emotionally, it was uh, unmistakable reaction of the kids singing it and of the people who are listening uh, ha hearing the the lyrics of aloha oi but in ilocano uh, being sung you know that is so nice because as somebody who came me <laughs> who came from the philippines in the 80s um i guess it's it wasn't easy for me to to adapt to live here um in the 80s a lot of filipinos here um, maybe the locals are not very welcoming with immigrants like me. Oh, that was my experience anyway, uh, that they make that distinction that you're book book because you're just you just came, you're an immigrant, you have a very strong accent or your English is so bad. But at the same time, I can sense through the work that you did that there's a lot of, of uh, respect to the culture as well, you know, the, the Filipino culture. And for you to come up with that, it... For me, it helped me understand and it helped me realize that um, it's not all that whatever bad experience I had, <laughs> you know, um, that there was a point in time that there's a lot of respect between cultures. Um, but um, thank you <laughs> for producing that. Although I'm just now um, finding out about that. I listened to the whole album after I heard about you. I, I should say that actually there's also a second album. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's it's mostly the other way. It's mostly Hawaiian songs from the late 19th century, early 20th century, that have been put into Rondalia and are in Ilocano, Tagalog, and um, Visayan. Um, I don't know it's, if it's because I know Dan Dan Soy. I speak the language that I thought that woman singing had a very beautiful voice, and it brings me back to my own childhood. And, you know, I'm just thinking now that this is... This is not just, you know, bringing up the cultures and all that, making people hear this song, but in, when I think about it too, um, you are actually um, pretty much, um, I don't know if the word is archiving, um, old songs that many Filipinos don't even know, even if they are in the Philippines. You know, you deserve a big award for propagating the the culture and patient your your what you're doing now will have a place somewhere so, soon you know it it's like fashion right it's evolving music is evolving the appreciation the people 
I mean, maybe because of the advent of social media, everybody all of a sudden it's like short um, attention span. You know, this TikTok thing in in a minute or so kind of production of whatnot, little dances here and there and little songs. But in the long run, I think people would go back to appreciating real music. And you're always, I believe, <laughs> you'll always have a place. Whatever you're doing now, don't give up. Don't say, well, we're not selling, you know, we're not. You know, if anything, you have already started something that nobody has done before. And um, fully, thank you. Even though I don't have any artistry when it comes to music, but I do appreciate real good music, culture and arts and all that. I, I'm so happy to have met you and uh, to Likewise. hear you. And um, I hope when I go to Maui, I'll, I'll get to call on you. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for um, uh, allowing me to hear from you to be interviewed. Surprise, surprise. I thought I researched him enough to have asked the right questions, but after more than an hour of a pleasant conversation, I still didn't know that he's also a movie producer. What an asset Lance is in the Hawaii community. And really, whatever he gets into in the near future, I would not be surprised. With all the talent and influence, Lance has remained gracious and down to earth. And not to mention a person with a big heart. And I'm proud to have met him. Truly, a treasure trove of Hawaii. This is Theta Pilar Pineda from Waikiki, Hawaii. Aloha.